Good afternoon. It's a it's a real pleasure to be back in uh, <coughs> excuse me in my alma mater, the Royal College of Surgeons, where I spent some of the happiest times of my life. Um, I uh, came here in 1985. I uh, graduated in 1991, so there was no upper and lower first med, thankfully. Uh, but many of my colleagues have experienced that experience. They've gone through that um, in the lecture theatre inside. I've sat in many lectures. Um, morning, noon, and night. I, pres I um, played in a live band dressed up as Billy Idol in front of 400 people. We had some various other uh, shindigs go on there. I met my wife here. Uh, I got married here. And I did all of my uh, significant exams in my life here. Uh, allied to that, that, my father worked here for 35 years as professor of surgery. So the first time I think I was in the door here, I was about 14 or so, and I've, I've never gotten over how... Uh, how fantastic a place it is, and I've just gone through my 20-year reunion last September, um, which I am still recovering from, uh, <laughs> but suffice it to say that the friendships and uh, the interests that you make in this college will stand to you for life, um, as they have done for me. My remit uh, today is to speak briefly on from some limited experience uh, uh, from uh, how to get into um, Australia or New Zealand. And in fact, I'm going to concentrate on Australia because anything that the Australians do, the, the, the Kiwis tend to end up doing it just a couple of weeks later. Um, so I, I know Australia, so I'll talk about that. I went there, I'm, I'm back now about five years, just over five years. So I went there for a year as a fellow, having completed my training in Ireland, my senior registrar training. Uh, so I had about 15 years postgraduate training under my belt at that stage. I went for a year. I ended up staying for three, um, basically because as time went on, there was nothing for me here. And uh, I became cheaper and cheaper to employ the more and more I enjoyed it there. So that worked out well for the department. Um, my wife was there as well with me. And I would give you one bit of advice from the off. If you are going to go later on in your life and go work in a fellowship anywhere in the world, because fellows don't get paid very well, and you do find that you're actually much more mature in life, you can be in your mid to late 30s, um, try and have one of you that has a good job, and then the other one can do the fellowship. Um, because, you, you know, you have bills to pay or come with a lot of money. A lot of the fellowships in the United States, James Carr neglected to mention this, many of the fellowships, you, they expect you to self-fund research fellowships, so they won't pay you for the year. Or they may give you a year of non-paid and a year of paid, etc. Thankfully, that doesn't happen in Australia, but um, it, it, it's, it's not as straightforward as, as, as being paid as well as the, the colleagues that you're working with. Just in terms of um, getting into the, the, into the antipodes, it's statistically easier to pass the entrance exams. I've spoken to a couple of the deans of medical schools and, and postgraduate training um, um, programs in Australia, and if you are Irish or an Irish graduate, and I take I, I, I include all the graduates of RCSI when I speak of Irish as they're part of the Irish family, and in your, it, it's much easier to pass the entrance exams if you are from here and taking the exam in the first five years after your graduation. So if you want to get the stay there forever and you want to do the entrance exams, do it earlier rather than later, um, because. Uh, once you start down that rocky road towards the 30s and middle age, you forget how to do exams and it becomes nearly impossible to pass anything. That's why it's very impressive that James Carr was able to go on and sit the, um, the ECFMGs. There is a deficiency of doctors in many regions in Australia, and I will show you why, because it's a huge country with very sporadic uh, population centres. This is Australia. <laughs> this, this, this is the reality of it. Don't mind down there, those ran... Rand McNally atlases, um, you'll see that the, the, the biggest thing is nothing. The whole center of the country is absolutely empty. There's one place called Alice Springs, which is one of the most bizarre towns on earth. There's a big lump of rock in the middle, which they keep changing the name of from Uluru, Uluru, Ayers Rock. It depends on, on where you come from, what age you are. Um, I didn't. I saw most of these things: sharks, stinging jellyfish, the sharks with freaking lasers. Uh, didn't see um, the deranged gunman and Danny Minogue. Thankfully, I managed to avoid as well. 
I was in Melbourne. Melbourne, to me, is the greatest city on earth. I say that as someone who is a complete convert to their way of life. There are some other relatively minor uh, population centres, including Sydney. It's a small town just to the north of Melbourne. Uh, <laughs> Brisbane, Perth, which is in the middle of nowhere, but seems to be the richest city on earth. And way up north is Darwin, but uh, you, you, you don't really count that. So, so really, you've got <laughs> Melbourne. And halfway between Melbourne and Sydney is Canberra, which is the Australian capital. It was built deliberately there because, as you can notice, there is a slight rivalry between Melbourne and Sydney. Sydney is the sort of um, the, um, the uh, it, would, it would be considered to be the commercial hub to, accept, to a certain extent, and Melbourne would be more of the artistic or uh, cultural hub of Australia. So Canberra is in the middle and has the advantage of having neither of those things. <laughs> so we didn't put that in either. Anyway, back to some serious. Uh, um, activity. Australia is an English-speaking country primarily, however it is an enormously multi-ethnic country and you will find many, many different languages spoken. I had the uh, great pleasure of sitting with um, um, John Wu, who was a, the first non-Australian uh, mayor of Melbourne. Now Melbourne is four million people by itself, so it's the whole population of Ireland is packed into this city, which is a very large city, but John was uh, from Hong Kong originally, came as a penniless immigrant and ended up as, a, as, the, um, as the mayor of, uh, of, of, of this city of four million people. So you can rise up through the structure no matter where you come from and how many generations you have or have not been in the, in the country. And that applies throughout their society, not only um, to medicine. It's a very similar strict training structure to Ireland. It's a very similar public-private training or uh, practice mix. About 50% of their population have uh, private health care insurance, uh, which is about the same as we have here. However, uh, to uh, our chagrin and to Australia's credit, I'm in private practice now, and they all ex charge a gap. So everyone who walks into a private practitioner expects to pay out of their own pocket as well as out of their insurance. Um, which is something I'd love to have brought in here, but that seems to be going in reverse. One third of Australians have direct Irish heritage and believe that they're actually more Irish than the Irish themselves. The other third seem to be either Italian or Greek, and then the other third, uh, there's an amazing amount of Italian and Greek people in Melbourne. Um, in the public system, I would say 60 to 70% of the time I was speaking through interpreters in either Italian or Greek. Um, and then the other one third uh, are mainly uh, Asian. It is a country, as you can see, it's used to immigration. They have often sent out requests. Uh, they've got what they call the 10 pound palms. So in the 50s, they had no people. So they, um, they offered safe passage to Australia in 1950s to the early 60s for 10 pounds for anyone from England. Uh, you got a boat for a tenner and you got your visa and they give you a little plot of land and you got started up. Um, they went straight after the war, they went to Greece and Italy and they tried to encourage Greeks and Italians to come. So they have actively promoted inward immigration into the country. Uh, the sense of fair play that um, you'll see in some of their sports teams and not, not some of the others uh, is ingrained in their psyche though everyone is entitled to a fair go. So if you come and as I say you start as a, a penniless immigrant from Hong Kong with no English, um, it's just as reasonable for you to expect to end up as being mayor of Melbourne as someone who has come from uh, straight off the first uh, immigrant boat. Because you have to remember half of the first immigrants to Australia were convicts. Um, so they, some of them don't delve too heavily into their heritage. So they're very, very good about a uh, sense of fair play. They don't like people who get above themselves. If you're a bit uppity, they will uh, knock you back into place. They call it the tall poppy syndrome. And that's, that's quite, a, that's quite a, a, a good safety net to have. There is a myth that we were asked to talk about the myth and the reality. The myth is that Australia is full of happy, gorgeous people who are surfing and having barbecues all the time. And of course, the reality is that it's full of happy, gorgeous people surfing and having barbecues all the time. Um, as I said, the training is very similar. It's an internship, a one-year internship. It's two-year BST, basic surgical training. That's I'm a urologist, so that's kind of the, the area that I'm most familiar with. And then there's an intermediate level of one to two years, higher specialist training or HST uh, training uh, of five years. Um, you must have an internship before you go in. The main choke point is that the resident medical officer or the senior house officers that have that basic training two-year area. <laughs> Um, and in actual fact, that intermediate training level, which we have in this country and you've seen on other of the flow sheets, usually seems to be marked with an X and can go from anything from three months to 42 years uh, before you become a, a higher specialist trainee, um, is, is not as apparent in Australia. They tend to get you straight from a good residency program onto your specialist training program. 
and your registrar or senior specialist registrar years of five to six years and they almost insist and it's again it's ingrained in all postgraduate culture in Australia that you go away for a year um, and in fact many people will go away for two years they'll take one year off completely and they'll backpack around the world and work in South Kensington as a barman for six months etc um, and then do some other stuff around the world and then the other year they'll actually spend uh, working so but they do all work overseas for a year they believe that they need to uh, and they believe it's important many of them go to the United Kingdom but some of them go to the uh, go to Asia and some to the United States so as I said there's usually not a gap between the resident medical officer or the senior house officer year and registrar or SPR training there are academic fast track options uh, Neil Corcoran who's a good friend of mine he was extremely valuable in, in me getting my fellowship he had been my trainee at one stage and Neil is uh, one of the brightest young men to come out of Irish uh, Irish medicine and uh, specifically Irish urology uh, so Neil has gained, taken up residency he's married an Australian um, and he's, he lives there full time now. So he has gone down what is a fast track academic option. If you're willing to put in the time to do a PhD, etc., they will accelerate your time into your, your specialist training program, your, your registrar level or senior registrar level or whatever you want to call it. Um, and they will knock a couple of years off and they will give you priority into those slots because they want people to stay in the universities, stay in the university hospitals, become professor of urology or professor of neurosurgery, etc. Uh, for general practitioners, you can go and do your final exam after four years of training and you can gain full fellowship of the Royal College after seven years. There are multiple general practitioner and consultant posts, so there are posts at all levels um, or in all specialties, especially if you're willing to move. If you're willing to go slightly outside the major urban centers, um, it's uh, very straightforward to get a job. You must get a residency of the country. This isn't a medical residency. This is your state or national residency at some stage. And there are many pathways to entry, but this is with many, many places is, is the most difficult uh, or can be the most difficult thing. So you can go with a job offer or a sponsorship, much like a, a J-1 visa or travel on a visitor visa and gain an employer that's willing to sponsor you there. And then at that stage, you go for a permanent or sorry, you can go for otherwise you can go for a permanent or temporary resident, a PR or TR. And the TR visa, the temporary resident visa is actually quite generous. It's four years. So if you're going to go for a fellowship, even if you're um, you know, a vagabond like myself who, who ended up going for three, that TR, that temporary residency visa uh, took care of all of that very easily. My wife, who is very, very organized and gets everything, all her ducks in a row very quickly, um, she applied for it, I applied for it, I applied three and a half months later than she did with only two months to go before we left. Um, she got a six month temporary resident visa and had to renew it every six months and I got the four year resident, temporary resident <laughs> visa and didn't have to renew it. So I don't know what lesson that tells you, but uh, my advice would be get the process going as early as possible. It's at least six months, you have to do a medical here, etc. Um, many people can apply for a temporary residence visa in what they call an area of need and then transfer to a permanent residency visa and they give you a lot of credit as, it, as was mentioned in Malaysia. Uh, they give you a lot of credit for having worked in an area of need. Now an area of need in Australia is a very different situation to an area of need in many, many other countries. The whole of Queensland is an area of need. That, can, that, can, that um, includes Brisbane, uh, which is a, a really wonderful city, um, Surfers Paradise, the Gold Coast, all of these fantastic names, these are all areas of need. So you're not out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Geelong, who are the current AFL uh, footy champions, if you go to Melbourne, that's all you'll do, uh, is listen to people talk about Geelong and Collingwood. That's an area of need. It's about 25 miles, 30 miles outside of Melbourne. The Peter McCallum Cancer Centre, which is um, the largest cancer centre in the Southern Hemisphere, if you work there, you're considered to be working in an area of need. So it's not that you're working in the inner city in a public clinic and you're getting stabbed all the time. There are some fantastic places that you can actually work. And so they show their appreciation by allowing you then to transfer to a permanent residency visa and allowing you to, to move into, uh, into, into practice. They, do have a, or they used to have a block whereby you have to spend 10 years in the country before you can start doing any private work. If you work in an area of need, you can reduce that down significantly to at, at most five years and then even less. And if you get involved in academic, um, get an appointment via a university, that can be reduced down to two. So in actual fact, while you're doing your job, you can actually be accruing your time uh, before you um, uh, would be allowed to have free reign in private practice. 
one of the great things about um, being from Ireland is that we get si signed into all of these wonderful um, pathways such as the competent authority pathway. There are five signatory countries in, along with Australia and those are Ireland, the United Kingdom, the USA, Canada and New Zealand. And if you get a job offer from Australia, from a, from a, a department in Australia, you get immediate employment. Um, you have light touch supervised practice for 12 months and then you get your full registration without any examination at 12 months. So basically, if the head of department says, yes, we'd like to take you on board, there's no problem. You can go there for the year. Uh, and if he's keeping a you know, reasonable eye on you, um, you can then have your full registration without having to sit further exit exams. Other pathways would include the work-based assessment pathway, which applies, means you need 12 months clinical supervision plus a pass in an MCQ that is in 2009 and 2010 was being trialed in Western Australia and Victoria. Um, there was problems with cross-agreed examination instruments, validation of assessors, etc., because of the clinical supervision. So I, I can't tell you exactly, as in from 2011 per se, where that stands, but I think it's still a work in progress. There's also the full Australian Medical Council pathway, which requires an MCQ, clinical exams, and 12 months supervised uh, um, practice. And that's at registrar um, or consultant level. There's the College of General Practitioner pathway, which you can acquire about specifically from them. But as I say, after four years, you'll be, um, you'll be eligible to practice independently. After seven years, you'll have your full membership. And then if you want to go at a higher level as a subspecialist or specialist, such as a urologist, you apply or talk to the very specific colleges uh, there. So the fastest route, because this is really what you want to know, Apply for an area of need temporary registration position sponsored by an Australian employer. So go to Brisbane, for example, under the 457 visa scheme, which is an employer nomination. So the employer nominates you um, to be the recipient of this visa. This obviously, obviously immediately provides you with a job, which entails that there's clinical supervision. Uh, you apply to the Australian Medical Council for assessment under the competent authority pathway which, as we said, is available to UK, Ireland, Canada, New Zealand, and US graduates only. So that's graduates, not citizens of, graduates. Um, by 2009, 2,500 applicants had applied via that pathway, and 1,000 were selected to participate. So it's about 1 in 2.5. And what um, Ian Frank, who's heavily involved in this, um, was very, very pleased with, and, the, and the, uh, the Ministry of Health were very pleased with the way that they had done things because in actual fact what they did was they took the best thousand candidates out of the two and a half thousand and uh, sent the rest home. So they're getting very, very strong medical graduates uh, or, or physicians coming over. So at the end of that first full year or end of that first 12 months, you will then secure full registration. And on that basis, you can apply with your full registration to, to go from um, a permanent onshore residence uh, through the ENS or points tested independent process. So basically you get a certain amount of points for each quality that you have. Being a physician, you now get positive points, whereas you used to get negative points. Speaking English, you get positive points. Uh, being a, um, I think the ones that get the most points are carpenters and electricians. So if you have any highfalutin ideas of what, how good you are as a doctor when you come out, just remember the Australians think that a carpenter is twice as important as you are. Um, maybe that's orthopedic surgeon. I, I, this, they're, the same. <laughs> they're the same, aren't they? That's all right. So there's something wrong there. Uh, what about the working hours, lifestyle, etc.? There's supposed to be a working time directive, but it's often ignored. You just get on with your job and you do it. Uh, as a resident medical officer or senior house officer, that's where you'd be going into if you came out of your internship and went over there. You don't do this um, lunatic system of going in on a Saturday morning at 9 a.m. and leaving on Monday night at 7 p.m. You do a separate night shift rota. You do one week, you come in at eight, you leave at eight, there's handover at the beginning, handover at the end, you're well supervised, and then you get the next week off. So that's government mandated, uh, and it makes a big, big difference to your lifestyle. Uh, usually there's no 36 hour shifts or greater for resident medical officers. The cost of living when I was there, now that's five years ago, is about 50% of what was it was in Ireland. I think you could probably say, that given the flip that's gone on, uh, it's probably 
completely the reverse now and it's about 50% more. Now, I think they're about the same. Uh, but when we were there, we were living in a five bedroom house, 10 minutes from work with a park within cycling difference and a swimming pool for 700 euro a month. Uh, with three you know, decking out the back, going down to our barbecue area on another level, and then down to the pool on another level. <laughs> yeah. So even on, um, even though I was receiving a low paid allowance from the Australian government, which is a badge of honor for me because of the little pay that I was getting in my second year, we were still able to enjoy an enormously uh, fantastic lifestyle. But as I say, bring some money and uh, bring someone else who's going to be able to pull in a good wage. There's a fantastic idea in Victoria. They didn't want to give the doctors a pay rise about 15 years ago. So what they did instead was they gave them a thing called salary packaging. So it means that if you put something on your credit card, which is and food or food, food and beverage, it can't be beverage alone. We learned that <laughs> very quickly. But you can minimize the amount of food, if you know what I mean. Um, but if you put it on your credit card, they will give you 30% back, I think it was. Basically, they take, the, they take most of the tax off it. That also applies to your rent and your mortgage. So some people, and that was for all doctors, so some people were putting their weddings on it and they would get 30% off. And it's, it's specifically for physicians. I don't know how they managed to do it. Um, the other great thing about that is, is that um, when you go out for dinner and there might be 10 doctors, into some de departmental thing, the restaurants will give you all an individual receipt, not of your meal, but of everyone's meal together. <laughs> and then you send that into the government so you walk out with a profit. It's, uh, <laughs> And everyone seems to think it's very reasonable to do. <laughs> so in terms of your family, I, obviously I was never involved in anything as bizarre as that. For your family, a uh, temporary resident or permanent resident allows visa for your family members. Uh, and in actual fact, they have an easier time as the family member of someone on a TR or a PR uh, because they can get a work visa straight away. They don't have to go through any of the rigmarole. So once you are accepted, all of your family is accepted. Uh, as long as you know they're uh, they're allowed to work uh, by age, etc. Um, you can get um, a uh, you can go on to get a permanent residency visa. That's no problem. And during that time, this is for your family members. Any of those temporary residence years will count towards citizenship or residency. So if they're there on a on a on a um, if they're there as your partner on a temporary and you're on a temporary residence visa. You'd have to complete the four years, but they will also get credit for four years towards your perm their permanent resident visa, even though they didn't have an independent visa. So this will be up on the, you, you know, you can never write these things down. Um, the other ways of going through them, as well as the official websites, are recruitment agencies. Just be a little bit beware of them. Uh, they like to set up their stalls and bring you to the Shelburne Hotel and feed you a few canaps and canapes, whatever way you want to call it, and a glass of champagne, and then convince you that you want to work in Wagga Wagga uh, for two years as a flying doctor. Um, they have their own vested interests. They get paid a lot of money to try and get places into pe people into places that there aren't an awful lot of, uh, uh, an awful lot of doctors. Um, specific hospitals and concentrate on the major cities. Again, there is a network system. Neil Corcoran was very helpful to me. Um, I came in at a, a senior level to Neil, and then following me, there's been seven further fellows, all from Ireland, who've come uh, to the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Uh, Richie Power then also went to uh, Brisbane. There's another chap, Rustam, um, who is in another hospital in Melbourne. So there's at least 10 neurology trainees who have gone through Australia in the last 10 years. And that's in a very small subspecialty. So that network of Irish people is important. Um, there is a sort of an Irish ghetto of medics in Melbourne. It's very easy to, to bump into people that you know, that you've come across in your training. Uh, and of course, then you're all expats together. So even though you thought he was a bit of a, uh, you, you, yeah, you, know, you know what you thought of him. <laughs> but you'll be in the Celtic club watching Ireland play England at four o'clock in the morning in a rugby match or the, you know, the hurling final. You develop a sudden interest in GAA that you never had before. Uh, various things like that. Uh, but unfortunately, you have to do a lot of your sports watching uh, in the middle of the night. So in summary, Australia calls itself the lucky country. I'd be in full agreement with that. It's a, it's a marvelous place, wonderful climate. Uh, within three hours of Melbourne, you could ski, uh, but yet you could have 30, 35 degrees in the middle of the summer. We went up to New Year. Remember, it's reversed, so it's, it's, it's underneath. So New Year's Eve, when I was there at 9 p.m., it was 41 degrees. Um, and one... 
just after I left, I had an awful fire in Victoria, and it was Melbourne itself was the hottest place on earth. It was about 50 degrees. Um, but it's usually quite good. They're obsessed with skin cancer, so much so that they're all getting rickets now. But kids, if you go out with if you go out with a sunburn, you're you you will be shunned, and you'll be taken to a doctor by some stranger on the street who'll just drag you off and try and embarrass you. <laughs> So don't go out with that Irish attitude that, you know, red is actually a nice color. It, it, it's not. <laughs> you want to look more like James Carr does. Um, doctors are in very great demand. Irish trained doctors are in huge demand. Um, you speak English. You come from a, a medical school system, which is very similar to theirs. In fact, the HPAT now that some of you may have had to sit, I'm not sure of the age level of anyone so f in here. Uh, is based on the Australian HPAT. It's, it's actually called the exact same thing. So the, the entry level um, um, uh, MCQ that they do coming out of school into, into medicine is, is based on the Aussie one. So they're very familiar. We have a lot of great relationships with each other. Uh, the, the communities know each other very well, the medical communities. It, you don't have to throw a stone very far to find someone who knows a guy who's Irish or knows a girl who's Irish or who went to college in Ireland, et cetera, et cetera. I, there was, I think, 12 of my classmates from the RCSI working in Melbourne in the time I was there, maybe more, 15, some of whom were Australian uh, and were back there. Um, it's a diverse and egalitarian society. They, they, they work to live. They don't live to work. You don't sit down and do nothing. You work very hard when you work, but they will take their time off. Um, school holidays seem to be some time when you know, theatre lists just used to disappear and be cancelled. And you'd ask why, and they'd say, oh, it's school holidays. And you'd go, so, so what? All of the surgeons are taking their kids off on holiday. They're going somewhere. And their school holidays are broken up. They seem to be about every six weeks, rather than having a one big block in the middle of the summer, because the, the summer is the middle of the winter, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, try and use direct contacts. Uh, they appreciate people who write to them. They really appreciate people who make the effort to go, because it's so far away. Anyone who arrives in Australia, it's kind of, if you come from this part of the world, you're treated as as a kind of visiting royalty to a certain extent because you made a big effort. So if you want to go and do a training program, take two weeks at some stage in your life, go over, set up three or four interviews in a couple of cities and go around and see the people. And they'll, they'll be very appreciative of the fact that you made that effort, that you're not just sending out a generic email to 10 different places. Um, you know, and there are worse things to do than visit Australia for two weeks. Um, try and stick to the recognized training modules. I would advise that you get a couple of years under your belt here before you go, unless you're considering moving there permanently or obviously you're an Australian resident and you, and you want to go home. I don't think you gain an awful lot. Sorry, I don't think you can, can contribute as much if you're very, very junior. It's very difficult to stand out uh, if you've only got 12 months experience behind you because they've all done the exact same thing. And then you're, you know, you're fighting against uh, the same thing. So I give yourselves a couple of years, get a couple of exams under your belt, et cetera. Don't run away immediately. Although many people seem to be in it, seems to be what everyone is up to uh, uh, nowadays. The other issue is if you go for a year, you know, two years after you've left, or you go for two years and you spend six months of it backpacking, et cetera, then you come back to Ireland, and then you're trying to get a job. You really haven't progressed your career. You've had a good time, but I can guarantee you if you're sitting in front of someone who's 60 years of age, who's been working a one in two for 40 years, and they're wondering whether they're going to employ you or not or put you on a training program, they have no real interest about you know, the time you went to Alice Springs or what you did in Darwin. or you know. Um, so just be a little wary of that. That being said, I'd love to go back and take that year out and wander around the world. Um, but try and get value for money when you're there. Don't go off and, you know, you will be offered from these recruitment agencies. You do six months of flying doctor and six months in a, in a sort of city hospital. I would advise you to reach a little bit higher. Um, I don't think you can contribute an awful lot one year out of medical school as a guy who flies into anything from a case of pneumonia to um, a spider venom bite to a, a farming accident in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you don't have the skills to do that, but you're, you're just filling in numbers. Uh, whereas you can learn an awful lot more if you're with your peers who are doing the same sort of level of work. So that's all 